Well, welcome to another exciting edition of Advanced Level Chemistry here at Spain Park High School. It is Wednesday, January the 20th, 2021. And we are going to be discussing intermolecular forces today. So far, we've talked about ionic bonding, which is going to be the attraction between two oppositely charged ions, which is caused by um, metals losing electrons, you know, non-metals gaining electrons. So we say the electrons are transferred in an ionic bond, creating ions, positive and negative ions, and that's what makes them attract to one another, the positive attracted to the negative. That's an ionic bond. When you look then um, for a covalent bond, we look at an atom covalently bonded, and the key word there is sharing of electrons. And so the electrons are shared, and they can be shared either equally in a nonpolar bond or unequally in a polar bond. We also had a metallic bond where the, the key phrase there is the C of free floating valence electrons. And all of those bonds are relatively strong. But what we want to look at is okay, in a solid co covalent substance, what's actually going to be holding the molecules together? So when I look at water molecules and I have the independent molecule here, what makes it stick to itself to where it like in an ice cube? Well, how does it come together? Okay. So on this worksheet that I have for, given to you, okay, we can obviously see that this is a solid, this is a liquid, and this is a gas because of the positioning of the molecules. Okay. So we would assume that the attractions are going to be stronger in a solid because they're held tightly in place. They're a lot looser, not completely broken because water molecules are just really rolling around one another, but they're still touching, they're still sticking together. That's why water forms droplets and it, it pools on a table because there's still attractions between them. But the gases are completely independent, they're broken apart, then the attractive forces are much uh, weaker generally on a gas, okay? So we're just kind of looking then at what holds the particles together. And again, we've talked about ionic bonds and covalent bonds. And in an ionic bond, notice the bond's energy is 800 kilojoules. That's, that's how much energy it takes to break a mole of those molecules apart, 800. So it really is just, we're gonna look at the relative size. 800 is pretty big. A covalent bond, the sharing of electrons between two nonmetals, this would be like, uh, Na plus and Cl minus, here the covalent bond is going to be the sharing of the pair of electrons between these two. Now it's still got a high bond energy, about 400, but it's not as strong even as an ionic bond. Metallic bonds are somewhere kind of in there, they're kind of their own unique thing, okay? But notice that these are what we call intramolecular forces. These are the forces within a molecule. But what we want to talk about today are intermolecular. So when we look at these, it's a matter of what holds what is the bond that holds molecule to molecule. If I have a CH4 and a CH4, If I have two CH4 molecules, the question is, what's going to hold those together? What is pulling them? And we're going to find that there are three what we call intermolecular forces. Intra means within, inter means between, the forces between molecules. And there are three of them, okay? We're actually going to talk about this one, and then this one, and hydrogen bonds last. Notice the strength. Not 800, not 400, but only 10 kilojoules, 25 kilojoules, 40 kilojoules. So these are much, much, much weaker forces than a covalent bond. Now the importance of that is, is that, okay, so we have liquid water and we begin to boil the water. Okay, so you have water in a beaker, you're heating it up, okay, and then the bubbles begin to form. But this is steam, right? 
So steam is still H2O. So we're not breaking. When we're looking in here, we have water molecules in here bonded to one another. We are not breaking the hydrogen and the oxygen. Okay, I always ask the question, what's in the bubble when water boils? Well, it's not air because air can't get into the water from here. Okay, that's why we can't breathe underwater. Okay, um, it's not hydrogen or oxygen because the water molecule is staying intact when it turns into steam. What we're breaking are these intermolecular forces. We're breaking the bond that holds water molecule to water molecule, this bond right here. And we're going to talk about how strong each one is. Okay, so the first one is called a London dispersion force. Okay, a London dispersion force. This is a natural attraction between all molecules. All molecules have this London dispersion force. Now the way that that works is that if you have two molecules, let's just say a CH4 with its electron cloud going around it and another CH4 with its electron cloud around it. Okay? As these molecules approach one another, the electron clouds begin to interact. Electrons are negative, they're going to repel. So the electron cloud is going to distort and be much more dense over on this side. And electrons are negative, so we're going to say that it forms this negative, partial negative, and this is going to be a partial positive side. On the other hand, I need a different purple marker. This one's doing the exact same thing, but just in reverse. So this is the positive and this is the negative. Now, when another molecule comes along doing the exact same thing, the positive end of one attracts to the negative end of the other, and we get this London force. So this is the, the positive side, then this is be the negative side, and they're going to attract. But a lot of times it's called an induced dipole because we're forcing it like when you induce labor, you force a woman to go into labor. It's not happening naturally. Normally, the electron cloud is very symmetrical. We don't have a positive or negative end. But when the molecules interact, we induce a force, a dipole, force a positive and negative. But as soon as the molecules break apart, then they go back to being symmetrical. So other names for this London dispersion force, we sometimes call it an induced dipole. In other words, dipole meaning two poles. In other words, it's polar. We're making it positive. We're making it negative. Okay? Or sometimes it's called an instantaneous dipole. Because it only lasts for a second. Because it's so short-lived, it's very, very weak. This is the weakest of all attractions between particles. This is the weakest one of all of them. These London dispersion forces. Very, very, very weak. So things that only have London dispersion forces are the, have the weakest attraction. They're the ones that are going to be gases at room temperature, and they're going to be able to, you won't be able to liquefy them until you get them down, like liquid oxygen is negative 186, I think. Uh, liquid nitrogen is negative 196, somewhere in those range. Those numbers may not be exact, but it's approximate. Somewhere around negative 200 degrees. You have to cool them down, slow them down enough to where those weak, weak, weak attractive forces can make those molecules stick together, okay? Now, London forces do increase with the size of the electron cloud. As the molecules get bigger, the electron cloud gets bigger. So if I go to C8H18 octane, it has a much bigger electron cloud. So when it distorts, When it distorts, there's a lot more area for it to push over. So we get a more distinct positive and negative end. Okay? So when we're looking, and even if you want to follow along in your notes here, when you're looking at the intermolecular forces, okay, it increases with molecular mass. Bigger molecules 
have higher melting points than the small molecules is because the electron cloud is more polarizable, it's more distortable. And the more electrons you put over on this side, the stronger the negative is going to be. And so when this distorts, let me see if I can draw it better this way. When this distorts, we have a whole lot more electrons over here, so the negative is going to be stronger and the positive is going to be stronger. Now, the most obvious example of that is if I look at just a whole list of hydrocarbons, CH4, that's methane. That's called natural gas. That's what's coming out of the gas jets here. If you have a gas fireplace at home, that's what, or gas heat, methane is what's basically coming out. There's also a little bit of ethane, C2H6. And then you have propane, C3H8, C4 butane. This is what's in big lighters or, or you know, a striker such as this. These all have butane in them. It's compressed, so it's a liquid, but as soon as you take the pressure off, gas is coming out. And so C4H10. So all four of these are gases, okay? Those are all gases. But then you go to C5, H12, C6, H14, C7, H18, pardon me, 16, C8, H18, okay? This is octane, which is in gasoline. So it's a liquid. All of these are liquids. But we call them volatile liquids, meaning, most of the time we think of the word volatile as meaning explosive, uh, but what it really means is that it just goes off quickly. All of these are going to evaporate very, very, very quickly. But as you get more and more carbons in the chain, as the molecules just get bigger and bigger, then the, the London forces get stronger and stronger. And we end up, even if you had like 18, 20 carbons in a chain, that's going to be like a paraffin wax that they make candles out of. Okay, so they're still solids at room temperature, but they do, as soon as you get any heat on them, they melt quickly. And so these are all weak attraction. They only have London dispersion force. Here's the key. It's the only type of attractive force between nonpolar molecules. So if the molecule's nonpolar, it only has these weak, 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 London dispersion forces, which we call LDFs, okay? So they're almost always gases at room temperature, unless it's a large, big molecule, then it might be a liquid, but then it's still gonna be a volatile liquid, meaning it's gonna evaporate quickly, okay? So it's important for us to know whether the molecule is polar or nonpolar, because we can predict the properties based upon that as far as what type of attractive force it's gonna have. We can explain why things are a gas at room temperature versus a liquid, okay? Now, the second type of intermolecular force is called a dipole-dipole attraction. Dipole-dipole. Okay? Now again, a dipole simply means two poles. That means it's a polar molecule to a polar molecule, okay? So, it's the attraction between the opposites. So this is dipole-dipole. It's the attraction between oppositely charged portions of two or more, and if you're following along in your notes, underlined, but more polar molecules. Only polar molecules are going to have dipole-dipole. All molecules have this London force. So if it's a polar molecule, it's going to have both. But the dipole-dipole is going to be much more significant. Okay? So if I'm looking at HCl, we look at the electronegativities, this is a very polar bond, meaning that the chlorine hogs the electrons. So the electron cloud is permanently, it, it's not an induced dipole, it's a permanent dipole. So this side is always positive, this side is always negative. So when another HCl comes along with its distorted cloud, with its positive and its negative, we get this attraction right there. That's the dipole-dipole attraction right there. It's the attraction between molecules. This is a covalent bond here. This is the intermolecular force, the dipole-dipole. It's because this is a permanent 
dipole because it's a polar molecule. This is going to be a much stronger attraction than the London forces. So generally, if something is polar, it's going to have a higher melting and boiling point than things that are nonpolar. Okay? So, um, obviously, the more polar the molecule, the bigger the difference in electronegativity, the more uneven the sharing of electrons, the stronger the positive and negative are. Just think, on your refrigerator, you have some magnets. Some magnets can barely hold a picture. Other magnets are super strong, and that's what you put your kind of calendar attached to or whatever. So they all have north and south poles, but they vary in strength. Polar molecules are just like that. They have positive and negative, but based upon the difference in electronegativity, the bigger the difference, the more distinct the positive and negative are, the stronger the bond's going to be. And we measure the strength of that bond by how much energy it takes to break it apart. In other words, how much energy it takes to melt it or boil the substance. So but the melting point and boiling point, that's a measure of the strength of how strongly attracted are the two um, atoms or molecules to each other. Okay? So, sometimes you'll hear this term, dipole moment. Okay? Down here at the bottom of the notes. The dipole moment is a quantitative measure of a molecule's polarity. So if you ever read something that says uh, HCl has a measurable dipole moment, that's a fancy chemistry speak for HCl is polar. So anytime you see the term dipole moment, it's talking about whether the molecule is polar or not. Now we're never going to do a quantitative measure, we're never going to use dipole moment. I just want you to be comfortable with that term, dipole moment simply means polar molecule. If it's something has a zero dipole moment, that means it's a nonpolar molecule. Okay? So, dipole, dipole. That one's pretty easy to see how that's going to happen. Okay? So that one's based upon the, the polarity. Now, again, bigger polar molecules, if you have a big molecule, so if I'm going to compare HCl to HBr, okay? Bromine is way bigger, has a lot more electrons than electron cloud, so it's going to have much stronger London forces. So this has polar and it's going to have London forces. Now it's not going to be as polar as this one, but it's going to have stronger London forces. So when you compare, um, you can just kind of see it's, it, it gets a little complicated. You're not going to have to be able to get into that detail, but they, they, these both have London and dipole-dipole. Now the third and final type of intermolecular force is a special type of dipole-dipole. It's called a hydrogen bond. Okay? So when I look at a water molecule, looks like this. Oxygen's electronegativity is 3.44. Hydrogen's is 2.20. So there is a big difference of 1.24 between the two. That's, and the scale is 0 to 4. That's a, that's a big difference. Which means the electrons are being drawn strongly towards the oxygen. This, this pair of electrons is not being shared equally at all. Now, what's unique about hydrogen is that it only has one electron. So when that one electron gets pulled away, that exposes the nucleus of each one. So, which is just really a proton. But now there are no electrons around the proton at all. They're all pulled away. So we get a very strong positive charge on the hydrogen. And because this is so electronegative, you get a very strong charge over here. So we get this negative and this positive charge. So when another water molecule comes along doing the exact same thing, the electrons being pulled here, this is my negative and this is my positive there's going to be a strong attraction right there to that. So that attraction between this highly electronegative, notice the hydrogen gets trapped between two highly electronegative things. And so you get an extra strong dipole-dipole. And when we go back and we look at the strength of those, okay, and you look at this, and we talked about the strength, a hydrogen bond is going to be stronger than your dipole-dipole. And water's hydrogen bond is probably even stronger than this. Okay? Now, the only three elements that can form hydrogen bonds are fluorine, 
oxygen, and nitrogen. And I like to think of it as foam. F-O-N, foam. Okay, fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. Now the key is, is that if there's gonna be hydrogen bonds, the hydrogen has to be attached directly to one of these three elements. If it's not attached directly to it, there's no hydrogen bonds. Let me give you an example. If I have NH3, the hydrogen is attached directly to the nitrogen. So the electrons are, the nitrogen is highly electronegative. So the electrons are being pulled strongly towards the nitrogen. That makes this hydrogen very positive. It makes the nitrogen very negative. So when another ammonia comes along, with this three hydrogens doing the exact same thing, being, oh well, we want to go the other way, sorry. Positive is not going to be attracted to positive. This negative, it's going to come here. Now notice the hydrogen is getting trapped between the two highly electronegative elements. The hydrogen has to be directly attached to the nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine for it to be able to have these stronger hydrogen bonds. Um, so if I look at alcohol, ethanol, it looks like this. So the hydrogen is attached directly to the oxygen, so therefore the electrons are being drawn strongly this way, the oxygen becomes negative, the hydrogen is very positive, so when water comes along doing the exact same thing, this being negative and this being positive, we get this attraction right there. That's the hydrogen bond right here. So that means that alcohol is going to be very, very soluble in water because of the strong attraction between the water and the OH here. Now on the other hand, if you take a compound the exact same formula, but it's called dimethyl ether, well it's not the exact same formula, but it's very similar, okay? So if I'm looking now here at this double bond, now I have oxygen and I have hydrogen, but the hydrogen is not attached to the oxygen. So there are no hydrogen bonds here. We would have this a trigonal planar shape around this carbon because it's AX3. It's going to be polar because of this oxygen bond here, but it's only going to be very slightly polar. And so as a result, uh, there are no hydrogen bonds. This is not going to be, these molecules are not going to be held together nearly as strongly as these are. Okay? So the key with hydrogen bonds is that only fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen with a, a hydrogen has to be attached to a fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen directly to it, but when then it does, it gives it special characteristics. Let me just say this. If it weren't for hydrogen bonds, if it, water didn't have those strong attractions as a small molecule, if it didn't have hydrogen bonds, it would be a gas at room temperature and life on Earth would not exist as we know it. So these hydrogen bonds are responsible for why water is a liquid which makes us able to live here on this third rock from the sun. If it wasn't for hydrogen bonds, water wouldn't take a lot of energy to warm up and take a long time to cool down. If it weren't for hydrogen bonds, when I went to St. Lucia over Christmas, I wouldn't have had 85 degree weather every day and 72 at night year round because it takes so much energy to heat up the Caribbean ocean, the Caribbean, the waters there, the, and versus um, the land heats up and cools off much more quickly, but water takes a tremendous amount of time to warm up, but it stores all that energy, so it takes a long time to cool down, so the air around all these big bodies of water is very consistent, but that's all due to hydrogen bonds. Snowflakes have six sides because when the water combines together to make a snowflake, it does so in this hexagonal crystalline structure with a hydrogen bond here, a hydrogen bond here, hydrogen bonds all the way around. So we get this open crystal structure. The hydrogen bonds are the reason why water expands when it freezes. So mountains are made into molehills because of the expansion of water weathering those mountains due to the formation of hydrogen bonds. 
Hydrogen bonds are super, 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 super important. If water didn't form hydrogen bonds and didn't expand like this when it froze, ice would, like most substances, would sink in the water and then lakes and streams in the north would freeze solid and there wouldn't be any life at all. I say all of that to say hydrogen bonds are very, 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 very important to us and cause water to have some very unique characteristics that if it did not have those, life as we know it would not be the same. Okay? So we have three different types of attractive forces. London, all molecules have this. Bigger molecule it is, the stronger the London force. Polar molecules have this. So we use phone call, F-O-N-C-L. If phone call is present, okay, but the hydrogen's not attached to it directly, then we're gonna have dipole dipole. But if we have a special type of hydrogen directly attached to fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, those molecules are gonna be held together by much stronger forces. So when water boils, we're breaking the weaker bond. Even though hydrogen bonds are in water, it's still very weak compared to the 400 uh, kilojoule bond energy of the covalent bond. So when water boils, you're breaking the hydrogen bonds. You are not breaking the covalent bonds. That's super, super, super important. Okay? Now, when we look at this question, intermolecular forces are non-covalent interactions between molecules. In other words, it's not the covalent bond, it's between molecules. So group B is the only one that has those. Group A, we're talking about ionic bond and covalent bond, those are intramolecular forces, okay? List the bonds of group A and the type of interactions of group B in order of increasing strength. Well, we just use this chart right here. So we can say ionic is the strongest, and then covalent, and then hydrogen bonds, and then dipole-dipole, and then London forces. So it's really straightforward, okay? So what I would like for you to do, um, and this is going to be your assignment for tomorrow, is for you to go through, uh, today's assignment is just to watch this video, but tomorrow I want you to go through and finish up this worksheet and see what you can do as far as using what we just talked about, using your notes, and then go and try and figure out the answers to this worksheet, okay? And that will be due by your class time on Friday, and I'll put a, an assignment in classroom for that, okay? So this is just a quick introduction to the three types of intermolecular forces and how they affect uh, molecules and that we measure them with the strength of the melting and boiling points. The higher the melting point, the higher the boiling point, the stronger the attractive force is going to be. And so we're going to just kind of learn how to measure and see what type of attractive forces are holding these molecules together. Okay? I am not going to be in class tomorrow due to the regional bowling tournament. So uh, you work on this in class or at home tomorrow. And then it will be due by class time on Friday. And uh, we'll go over it then and kind of make sure that we understand everything about IMFs as we try to finish up this unit. Okay? Hope you all having a great day. If you're enjoying these videos, please feel free to subscribe to my channel.